Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy. And I'm very pleased today to have Maria Lorino with us. Uh, she's written several books about Italians and Italian Americans. Uh, she's also a professor at NYU. So uh, welcome, Maria. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, so I definitely want to talk about the books. But before we do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about your family and, and where your family is from and research that you've done. Well, actually, my family and my research are both attached to my books because the um, the first time I really did a, uh, I went to Southern Italy and tried to find my family was when I was writing my first book, When you Were, were You Always an Italian? Uh, and I realized that if I wanted to write a book on Italian American identity and what it meant to be, in my case, a third generation Italian. That is my grandparents, which I call first generation, the first generation immigrants who came here, uh, came here uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, so anyway, yeah, my I've started to do some research really through relatives, you, you know, who is around in the towns. I knew that my mother's side was from a town uh, called Conza della Campania in uh, Avellino province of Avellino, and that my father's side was from the town of Picerno uh, in Basilicata. Uh, and um, so I went there with um, my husband um, and uh, made this, this first trip. Uh, my main success was in Conza because we still had relatives living there. Uh, and I traveled to Picerno, but I'm the youngest born in my family. So my parents were considerably, and they're the youngest of their family. So my parents were considerably older when I was born. Um, my dad was 44. Um, so his family, there were very few people, there were no Lorinos left that um, knew had any connection to us, uh, unfortunately. But my mother's side, she still had some first cousins in Konza. So I spent some time there. I spent a week there and it was just a just a wonderful experience of living in this. This town had been uh, destroyed in the 1980 earthquake. Um, and the government, um, because European governments do things differently than American governments do, actually rebuilt homes uh, and paid for them um, for all the homes that were destroyed. Uh, and so my cousins were living um, in really lovely new homes that they built them themselves, many of them, because they uh, many Italians are very good with construction and working with the hands, but had been financed by the government. Um, so after being some being homeless, some living in, you know, piled up with relatives, they actually had a very a decent place to live. And that was kind of wonderful to see and experience. Well, that's pretty that's pretty cool. Yeah, we we did our first trip. I was living in the UK uh, when I was working for Chase for a couple of years. So we did our first trip 25 years ago almost. Uh, and, you know, we did Rome, of course, you have to go to Rome. Uh, and then we went down to Sorrento and we just briefly in Naples, just to really get off the train and pick up a car. And I had no idea at the time that my, in fact, I didn't even know who my great grandmother was at that time, that she lived, that the whole family lived actually about a half a mile from the train station. Uh, and they virtually owned the whole block pretty much. Um, and um, so we have, we were supposed to go this past April and I, we had a whole tour set up with Italy rooting and they were going to, you know, we were going to meet 20 cousins that I found on the internet, Piero Malo cousins um, that, you know, we've gotten a connection, but we were going to meet in person and all of that. But uh, the interesting thing about the Avellino connection between you and I is that my ninth great grandfather was Prince Marino of Avellino. Oh, really? Huh? <laughs> he ruled over my people. <laughs> he was uh, the Prince of Avellino and the Duke of Atropalda and the Count of some other place and all of that. So um, we were going to go there, of course. Um, and so we're very, very disappointed. We're fingers crossed we're going to be able to go in May or June this year. Hopefully this vaccine works and we'll be able to go. Uh, so you got to the town. Um, and so what was the reaction from the first cousins? Oh, my God. <laughs> Una festa. <laughs> oh, they were, they were absolutely delighted. And they were so generous. And we had to go from house to house with everybody making their 
you know, dinners for us. And literally still, I mean, they would, you know, you'd see the chicken in the backyard and they're like, that's tonight's dinner. And I'm like, I don't want to know, just uh, <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> uh, incredibly generous. Um, it was a little, it was hard to communicate. Um, I did not grow up speaking Italian because my parents spoke dialect, some dialect, a little bit. They knew it wasn't the real Italian, the proper Italian. So they never, and they really didn't know that much of it. And they also had different dialects because my father was from Basilicata, my mother was from Avellino. So they had grown up, you know, in American schools and they, they spoke English, but just dialect words for, you know, points of exclamation on things. So I, I had a bunch of dialect words. That's all I had. I studied Italian um, after college. I took a, a, an accelerated course for a couple of years and then through language houses. So I had a basic um, level. Um, I actually was good enough at that time that um, I did some interviews. I did a, a chapter of my book on Italian dialect. I was trying to trace the roots of our words. And I was able to have a rudimentary interview with a, a professor at the University of Naples. Um, but my cousins, it was kind of doubly hard because they spoke um, a, some uh, Italian with also a lot of Southern dialect peppered in, not Italian American, but the true Southern dialect. Uh, so it was, you know, we tried, but communication was was hard. At one point, and it was extremely moving, um, we connected my my mother to, uh, by telephone to her first cousin. Um, my mother is named Conchetta, and we connected her to Conchetta. And um, but the saddest thing was, they couldn't uh, understand each other because Conchetta spoke a Southern Italian dialect from Italy, you know, twentieth century. M my mother spoke the remnants of her parents' dialect from really the 19th century, you know, when they were born in Italy and came here. So my mother was stunned that she couldn't communicate with her cousin. And she called up one of our cousins and she spoke in dialect. She said, do you understand me? And they're like, oh yeah, I understand you. So that's what got me actually writing about dialect. I, I wrote a, a chapter on that, on what we speak as Italian Americans and how that's changed over the years and become part of the American tongue. Um, another thing that I found really interesting was how, um, you know, so deeply tied in tradition Italians are, um, especially when it comes to naming, you know, that you often name your child after the grandfather. And so, so there was a parallel world of my grandfather, Natale, who came to the United States, his brother, Antonio, who my grandfather tried to bring over, but he didn't want to leave, and their children, Antonio had six children, Natale had four, but four of those children had the exact same names. So there was my mother, always called herself Connie, but Conchetta, Conchetta, my aunt Natalie, there was Natalia, my uncle George, there was cousin Gerardo, um, there was another uh, Michele, my uncle Mickey had died before when I was very young, so I didn't know him, but there was a Michele there. So it was just fascinating to see um, you know, these two kind of parallel lives. Um, it's particularly because Italian Americans um, really did stay in their enclaves for a, a long time when they were in the United States and preserved a very, very Italian world. And it was, it was fascinating. It was really one of the greatest experiences I've had was, was traveling to Southern Italy and spending time with, um, with the cousins. No, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. And, you know, we, similar, similar background, my, my dad was the youngest. Uh, his uh, his older brother and two of his older sisters were actually born in Italy, though. Uh, so, but he was he was born here. Uh, my mom, the whole family was born in America, but she was the, the she was the eighth out of nine. So again, they were both on you know like you towards the younger end. Um, and my my uncle Giovanni, he they left him in Italy when they came with his grandparents. Uh, and I never got the straight answer. I've heard two stories. One was that they were going to send for him eventually, um, but either they didn't have the money or they, they couldn't, or he didn't want to come because he was, you know, his, his grandparents were like his parents, I guess. Um, the other one was that they had planned to go back, like, like many people, uh, I understand, you know, did go back. And so all my cousins from, from him were all born in Italy. They came first to Canada around 1950 and had to spend five years there. So uh, he didn't see his parents for almost 45 years or meet any of his brothers and sisters until they eventually came over. Uh, and the same thing with the language, you know, uh, 
whenever they didn't want us to know something, they would speak in Italian. <laughs> uh, and my mom and dad, uh, my mom grew up with Barres. My father grew up with kind of the upper, 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 upper I can't say it, upper echelon, <laughs> uh, uh, Neapolitan dialect. So they were constantly fighting back and forth. You don't, you don't really know Italian, and you know you don't really know Italian. Um, so that's great. Yeah, I, I, and like I said, we were so dis- disappointed in in uh, doing that. So, so you decided to write the book. Um, you went to Italy because you were writing the book, not that's the right. other way around. Right, right. Oh, that's interesting. I'm trying to write a book. I'm the furthest thing from an author, but uh, I was. I have a lot of it done and I was planning on finishing it when I got back. So that's going to have to wait. Um, so the, so that was the first book and, uh, you know, what's the end result of, you know, were you always Italian? I, and I think Italians look at it two ways. I know there's people say I'm a hundred percent Italian and I don't care what the DNA says. Uh, and other people kind of grasp, grasp onto that. Well, yeah, I'm a little bit of this. I'm a little bit of that. I try to say it to people is, you know, my DNA may be a lot of different things, but my heritage is Italian. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. It's something that I'm constantly grappling with, uh, even after writing that book many years ago. Well, you know, it's interesting. The genesis of that book um, was that I, um, I was a, a I worked at the Village Voice. I was a reporter, staff writer at the Village Voice, and um, I wrote mostly about politics, city and local politics, um, and social issues, homelessness, uh, mental illness, um, lots of issues that were plaguing New York in the 80s when I, when I worked there. Um, but I was always very, very interested in writing about ethnicity and identity. Um, and the kind of, um, I grew up in a, um, in a suburb in New Jersey. I grew up in a very middle-class section of a very wealthy suburb, Shore Hills, New Jersey. And we um, felt the stigma of being Italian. When we moved into our neighborhood, um, my mother heard the chatter, the whisper of, oh, another Italian moved into the block. So as a child, I was extremely sensitive to this kind of prejudice and this, um, uh, this, this feeling um, about you know, the stereotypes about Italian Americans. And I always wanted to write about that. And I wasn't sure how to do that and how to find the form. When I was at The Voice, um, I was assigned a feature story on Mario Cuomo, who was then the governor of New York, and one of my uh, heroes. And so I, um, I went to Albany a couple times to interview the governor, who was a charming man and just um, uh, fascinating to talk to. But I was trying to place him in an ethnic cultural tradition. And so I would, I had a list of questions for him. And I said, um, you know, well, did Fiorello LaGuardia influence you? Did Vito Marcantonio, the you know, kind of leftist radical East Harlem, uh, I wouldn't say radical, but leftist East Harlem congressman influence you? Um, I'm a fan of Mark Antonio, by the way, and I have to ask you for some tips if I, I have a... I have a theory that I could be a distant cousin of his on my father's side. Um, but uh, so anyway, I was asking the, uh, the governor these questions and he looked at me and he said, were you always an Italian? And when he asked me that question, something just clicked for me. I, I got what he meant. And I looked at him and I said, no, I wasn't always an Italian. And then he said to me, oh, I know all about ethnic self-hate and started to talk about what it was like to graduate tied number one for your law school class in your law school class and have the dean say to you, well, if you want a job on Wall Street, you got to change your name. And so we began to talk about these kinds of you know, insidious prejudice that has affected Italian Americans and that they never really talk about. Um, and I wanted to write about that. And so that question actually framed the book. That was really my exploration. What does it mean to be an Italian American? What does it mean growing up? Um, you know, geography, I think, plays a big factor in, in how you see yourself as an Italian American. If you're in a very Italian neighborhood, everything's kind of cool. You know, I mean, you're, you're just sort of part of the fabric of the neighborhood. If you're in a, in a very waspy neighborhood, 
you feel like the outsider, you know, and then you try to find your place within that. Um, and so those were the questions that I went about wanting to explore. And I real and I also was very interested. I had started traveling to Italy in my when I was in my twenties. Um, almost every summer, it became a kind of ritual that I would, you know, just find a get a cheap flight, find a cheap place to stay. Um, I was fr- I befriended through an article that I'd written at The Voice, an Italian journalist. She would often host me, um, and um, and so I started spending a lot of time in Italy but not Southern Italy, in Rome, in Northern Italy. And I realized that if I wanted to understand what it meant to be an Italian American, I had to travel to my roots. You know, my roots are in the South and it's a very, very different life. Um, And so that was the thinking behind it that led to the trip and uh, that what led to the book. And then the trip was part of my research. Uh, Yeah. And, and, you know, to your point, I didn't have that as much. Um, I mean, I was in College Point, Queens, which was mostly German Irish, but when we got there, we were starting to become more and more Italian. But my grandparents were in Corona, Queens, which was it was Italian. I mean, every place you went, everybody you saw, the whole block was Italian. You know, so so I didn't really you know feel that as much. And the same thing in uh, high school. I went to high school in the story of Marta Christi, and you know, seventy five percent of the kids there were Italian. You know, so. Uh, you, you know, you didn't really, we really didn't come into that, but I have heard that about Mario Cuomo and that, uh, I know that he, uh, really did not like that mafia type stereotype. Absolutely. He was yeah. vehemently against that from everything I read about him. Um, and interesting story, uh, when I lived in England, um, and, you know, Italian from New York, you know, they only knew us from the movies. Right, right, right. <laughs> so they thought they thought everybody was a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> but I did use that to my advantage a couple of times. Get back in that car. <laughs> right. That's that's the thing. I mean, these things kind of haunt and plague us. Well, you know, when I was uh, when I was in junior high school, It's so hard to believe because, you know, America is so much more diverse now. But um, the fact that I had, and that was the other thing, my name, you know, my parents didn't name me Marie or Mary, they named me Maria. So I had a fully Italian name, very popular today that Maria is a very popular name. It was not popular then. I always begged them, like, why why didn't you change your name? Why did you name me Maria? You know, all of this stuff, because I had all these vowels. Um, And now I think they're beautiful. But when I was in seventh grade, I'll never forget this. You know, you have these moments that just last, uh, that happens to you as a child. Um, the teacher was d- calling roll call and everybody's, you know, name is, you know, John Smith and, you know, whatever. And she comes to my name and I was a very shy kid. And um, so I said here, but I said it softly. And she looked at me and just stared at me in the face and said, do you speak English? And, you know, it was mortifying. It was like, wow, <laughs> I'm totally American. And everybody laughs, you know, the whole class is laughing hysterically. And that was kind of astounding, you know, that here I am, third generation. Uh, I don't know any Italian. And uh, I'm being asked in class to my grave embarrassment and the laughter of the entire class if I speak English. <laughs> well, my, my daughter is, um, my, my children are adopted. So they're much, you know, we were 44 when we adopted these kids. You know, 40, I was, Marion was uh, about 39. But our, we named her Nicole Louise. Uh, my father was Nicholas. They, my grandparents didn't name him Nicola. They named him Nicholas, even though he's named after his grandfather. Um, and um, we just liked the word Nicole because it kind of went with Sorrentino. And um, Louis, uh, uh my wife's uncle was Lewis and uh, he had passed away and he helped pay for the, you know, a lot of the adoption bills. So uh, she, she got that name, but she's like, why did you name me that? Now she's, you know, she goes by Nikki, so it's okay. But <laughs> <laughs> how did I, you gave me an old lady's name, Nicole Louise. <laughs> um, but my, my brother, my grandfather was Ubaldo. There's no translation, even. Uh, and my cousin, he's the second son 
uh, but he's Ubaldo Di Maria. Uh, he eventually named his name to Joe. By the way, he was a photographer for the Post, the New York Post. Uh, he um, he changed his name, but my grandfather was very upset with my parents that they didn't name my brother Ubaldo because he would have. And my mother said, "Well, you have Ubaldo, you know." And he said, "No, it's not Sorrentino." Uh, and my mother said, "You know, I love you dearly, but I can't name my son Ubaldo in America." You know, uh, so he became John. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hard. You know, it's a it's a it's a culture that that clings strongly, strongly to its traditions, and then you have this this break and how you how you manage that. <laughs> yeah, and I just I just read a book and it, doing a little thing on it. Um, our uh, our Italian surnames, which uh, somebody told me about it. And it's a fascinating book because they they they. He does a little bit about the the um, given names, but most of the book is about the surnames and how the surnames came about. And I guess not too different from every, every other uh, ethnicity, but it is interesting to see how they came up with the, the surnames in Italy. And um, there's over three hundred thousand Italian surnames, hmm. so uh, hmm. more than any more than any other country. Really? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess you know Italians. They didn't want everybody to be the same. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so um, that's fascinating. Now, so I know you did a book uh, where you interviewed uh, a variety of Italian Americans from all walks of life. Uh, so, what was that? That must have been amazing talking to, to some of these people, like Lady Gaga and Madonna and people like that. But how did how did you do all of that? Well, that actually wasn't a direct interview. Those were just, no, what, what it was, was um, there was a, a PBS documentary. On a, no. Yes, I saw it. Yep. Yeah, fast, fast, great documentary. And the uh, director and writer of that documentary, John Maggio, uh, asked me if I could do a companion book um, that would go with, that would be released when the documentary came out. So um, I based my that book on the work that the documentary filmmakers had had done in assembly. And so, for example, there are, are 19 parts to the Italian Americans, the documentary. My book has 20 chapters. I added a, a chapter on the Italian American counterculture because that wasn't covered in the documentary. So um, we shared a wealth of information. We sort of worked together in partnership that way in sharing information because they had um, uh, the the Lady da, da, uh, Gaga and Madonna, I just added, but that was just um, research. Those weren't interviews. Um, but for example, there were interviews with characters in the documentary that we were able to use for um, a Q&A in the book. Um, and then what my book did was that, you know, even for four hours, no matter how long a documentary uh, is, and that was a fabulous amount of time that PBS um, allowed for it. Um, there's still so, so much more information that can't be conveyed in a documentary. So that was the idea to, on, on one hand, be a companion. So anyone who saw the documentary would be like, oh, you know, I like that. Let me look at this. And then to go more deeply into every story. And so I did extensive, uh, really uh, historic and archival research um, in order to, to do that um, and uh, kind of create different dimensions to, to the stories. Um, so, uh, for example, um, there's a wonderful story in the, that begins the documentary of the Italian Americans on Rosetto, Pennsylvania, uh, and how people in Rosetto um, lived longer than other communities uh, around them. And uh, health researchers were trying to investigate um, what it was about Rosetto that kept them healthier. And they discovered that it wasn't particularly genetic because Italian Americans, Italians from, they, most of them came from the town Rosetto in Italy. When they had gone to other parts of the country, they had the same health rates as everyone else. Uh, and it wasn't geographic because people in the neighboring communities got much sicker. And what they came to, decide, to understand was that it was community and it was the community of Rosetto that um, kept the Italian Americans healthier because they all helped each other and they all um, felt that they could rely on each other. They didn't have to worry about being alone. Um, and so it was a really, really interesting story. Um, and then, but I like explored it a little further to try to understand more customs of Italians. And, um, and one thing I was really surprised by was that there was a very, um, it was a very egalitarian community. Like nobody 
had, everybody had very modest homes. The people who were wealthy in Rosetto did not have huge homes. They did not have, you know, huge cars. And I thought, well, what is it, you know, about the Italian American spirit? Is there something that's sort of more egalitarian? And, you know, what, what is this about? And, um, and what I discovered doing further research um, from, you know, anthropologists who had spent some time there um, was that Italians were, um, they were still terrified of the evil eye. And when the Rosettans came to Rosetto, Pennsylvania, um, they kept a very equal lifestyle among them because they were afraid that if they had more than others, that the neighbors would cast the evil eye on them. And they were still doing potions back then of, you know, whatever it is you throw over your shoulder and whatever to, to cast off the evil eye. And it was just a fascinating look at, um, wow, this is how a community functions. And these are the things that we carry with us, you know, from the Southern Italy to America. Um, why was it they all lived in such kind of harmony compared to other places? Well, it was both because of that very, very strong sense of community. And it was a little bit of that, you know, mysticism and, and fear and fatalism that kept them, you know, not wanting to have too much that people would um, would then be jealous of them, and then you know their lives would be ruined. So so that was um so that was the kind of thing I did in the in the book, and just kind of elaborating the work that um, um the really terrific uh, writers and producers of the documentary had had done for their for their PBS version. Yeah, and that that really was a great documentary for anybody listening who hasn't seen it. I would highly recommend it because. Uh, it really gives you some deep insight into it. Um, you know, my dad, being a photographer for the Daily News, I mean, he obviously ran into a lot of Italian Americans uh, on both sides of the spectrum. I mean, he, you know, uh, always taking photographs of, you know, most of the New York City, uh, you know, be they mayors or councilmen or people like that. But then also, um, the mafia and, uh, you, you know, interesting story that I've, I've told a couple of times, the, um, the Gallo brothers in Brooklyn were notorious, I guess, uh, I guess it was the, between the sixties and seventies. And, um, my dad being Italian, I guess, you know, Joey Gallo put up with him a little bit more than he may have put up with, you know, a non-Italian photographer. And one time he was coming out and he, but he did like his picture taken. And one time he was coming out of the courthouse and my dad was taking his picture and there was somebody there who kept trying to push the camera out of the way every time he went to take a shot. So my dad said to uh, Joey, what's going on? I, I can't take your picture anymore. And he said to my father, don't worry, that problem is going to be taken care of. Well, about a week later, they found the guy in the trunk of a car. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, my father came home and he said, I hope I didn't have anything to do with this, oh my God. <laughs> which I'm sure he didn't. But, um, uh, but, you know, he, he, you know, he obviously saw a lot of the Italian and the American experience, um, as did my cousin Paul, who also was a photographer for the, for the Daily News. So we have a vast record of, of that Italian American experience. So there was a, a third book you wrote, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and what's what's the title of that one? And what's the old that world about? daughter, new world mother? Um, yeah, that came in between. I did where you always, and then old world daughter, new, new world mother, and then the Italian Americans. Um, that was um, I wrote old world daughter, new world mother after um, our son was born, who's now um, twenty three, and um, that was looking at um, it was really about culture and. Uh, the idea of freedom and growing up with very feminist values and trying to put all of this together. Um, it was about growing up in a very traditional Italian American household um, where women's roles were very, um, they were already well, very well defined. Um, and it was to be in the house and it was to, you know, cook and do all of these things. And uh, something I completely did not want to do. I was wanted to be educated, go out into the world, you know, um, and uh, very much wanted to be a journalist. And that's how I started. Um, and these were all really, really important values that um, I greatly, greatly appreciated my American education for um, allowing me these opportunities. Um, 
And then um, after I had a child, um, I realized how um, difficult it was to do both things and how we didn't really have a culture that, um, that valued nurturing. And, um, and I tried to, uh, to examine that and what the, the gift of, of American individuality and freedom, and those are great gifts, but there's also the gift of uh, community and uh, collective values and people helping each other. And, uh, and I realized that there was something from each culture that was very, very important for us to have and to bring together. So that book was a, was kind of an examination of that. Um, and I wrote it a lot, you know, now I'm delighted to see that we're moving forward in terms of there's now paid family leave. Um, you know, I wrote that book in, I don't know, 2009, I think it came out. And that was one of the things I was talking about, you know, why don't we have these kinds of things? Um, we have a culture that is just about the individual. Um, the Italian culture is about the collective unit. Um, and I wanted to, you know, I had this, this vision of, right, of what many other people share of trying to, to bring those two things uh, together. So, um, so Old World Daughter, New World Mother was that. It was kind of growing up with all these wonderful feminist values, um, but realizing that those values only go so far for women um, because it, this notion of you can have it all. Well, no, you, any working mother knows, uh, you know, that you can't have it all when you're trying to, you know, raise a child or raise children and, and work and, and do everything around the house. And, you know, and, uh, and so that was, was that kind of, um, but it was a, it was a, a memoir where I used my stories and sort of family stories of growing up and kind of going out in the world and sort of thinking about these things and, and, uh, coming, you know, bringing those ideas and thoughts together. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's probably one of the saddest things about the Italian American experience is that that's sort of drifting away. You mm -hmm. know, the, I think for various reasons, to, I think one of your points is, you know, the individual and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, people have moved away. Families are smaller. Uh, we still have it. But I see it with, you know, some of my, you know, second cousins or, from gen, you know, other generation cousins that, you know, will post stuff. The cousins of my generation will post stuff. And, you know, the cousins of generation or maybe even two below that don't understand it. You know, they don't have that experience anymore. Uh, and that's kind of the reason why I do some of this and probably you do, too, is to try and not to lose that. Um, and I know Dr. Shelsa, who's, who's going to be opening up the museum in October, which i um, very excited that that's going to happen. But I think that's what he's trying to do with the Italian American Museum in New York City is to not, not that we have to replicate that, but that we don't lose that, that the generations coming after us still know the hardships uh, that Italian Americans faced, and 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 you know, to your point, some of the prejudice, prejudices that that some people had. Uh, so I think that's real important the work that he's doing, and certainly certainly others. But um, going back to the to what we were talking about um, before we started, that's kind of why I do this because I don't want it to be lost, and I just find the stories when I whether I talk to you know author like yourself uh, or a professional genealogist or some of the most exciting things are just people that have done research uh, and hear their stories and, and compare and find the differences. Uh, it's to me, it's amazing. Um, and everybody says the same thing. When we go back to Italy, we feel like we belong there. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, I think that's true. Yeah. Two points on that. One, I just wanted to say when we were talking about the, the story that opens the, the documentary and, and uh, my book, The Italian Americans, about Rosetta, Pennsylvania. Um, what this, this community where, you know, they had lower rates of heart disease than anywhere else in the country because of this environment, um, that was only for a certain period of time. By the 1980s, um, their children started leaving because culture had changed and the kids were going off to college. They were finding other places to work. Um, you've experienced that, you know, yourself as a dad. Um, and, and that's, you know, just part of kind of this progress moving forward. But 
um, they, they their protect the protective health ability dropped. They had the same rate of heart disease as any, anyone else in the country. So you know, with things that are gained, where there's always loss, and it's always that balance in life, right, of loss and gain. And it's true. I mean, there are things, and so sometimes I think we tend to think that all progress is is benign, and there's never anything, you know, that's that's bad about that, but. There, there is. It's a, it's a loss and a gain in, in many, many things. Um, and uh, yes, no, and in terms of the, the genealogy and people going back that you were saying that feel very Italian, I think that's one of the most interesting things. Um, when I was traveling to Italy um, as a young woman and spending my time in Rome and Milan and all these great cities, um, I would make friends there and they would, and the Italians would just find it very amusing that I thought of myself as Italian um, because to them, I'm um, the American. There's nothing Italian about me. And if you heard my accent in speaking Italian, yes, that would really be confirmed. Um, but what I would try to say to them is, look, I get that, you know, I'm American educated. I'm American grown, but I'm a hundred percent, you know, genetically Italian, and uh, you know, science is teaching us more and more these days the very strong factor that genetics has in shaping our character. Um, and so, there are clearly part that we are also clearly Italian, and we feel it. And this, this, you know, as you're saying that this is what you hear when people go back. Well, there's a reason for that because genetically, that's that's what we are. And so it's a really interesting balance and exploration um, and appreciation of two cultures. It's really the very American story. I mean, that's, you know, going back to were you always an Italian? That was about, well, Americans were hyphenated. We're all the hyphen. We're Italian American. We're Irish American, you know, and we, and it's a great gift. You know, we, we, can, can, if we, there was a, um, a professor once who said that, um, that ethnicity, um, was a if you could appreciate the music only some hear the music but when you hear the music you could appreciate the revelation and i thought that was a really you know he said it more eloquently than i am but i thought that was a really lovely line that there are some of us who deeply hear the music um and when we hear the music and we explore it we feel the revelation of that music um and i think that's you know Perhaps this is what your own experience has been doing this podcast and talking to fellow Italian Americans who are going on that journey. Uh, yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And um, you know, there are some people with you know just driven to do this, and I, I don't know why. I mean, you know, I come from a f very big family, uh, and you know, I have one or two cousins that kind of do it a little bit. Most of them are like, ah. What are you doing that for? <laughs> and I said, I, well, you know, I always liked history, so that's part of it. I said, but I always felt I needed to know where I came from. And I don't know why. It's just instilled in me for some strange reason that I don't understand. But, uh, but anyway, this has been fascinating. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and um, I love hearing these stories. And uh, just to close, where can people find your books? Amazon. <laughs> That's the easiest way. And I'll, I'll put the links out there so people can find them. Uh, and uh, well, thanks again. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>